folks, there's nothing to be said but that this is a rough one. If you're having a bad day, don't watch it. I've thought for a week, is there a way that I can moderate this decree? And I cannot find it. I can only hope that we can act and create the best path forward. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in Oregon. We've got quite a few IR community members in Oregon, and you may recall that our first-gen outlook for Oregon, the NCA 4-based outlook, was unexpectedly difficult. I'm going to give you an honest assessment of your state's updated outlook. You should be prepared that this one is high change. We're going to look at what you're up against and talk about what we can do to build resilience in Oregon's strong communities. If you're attached to the land in Oregon, you know that Oregon's soil is precious. Oregon soil is some of the most valuable and productive soil in the entire world. If you're building resilience in place in this state, you're going to be on the front lines of the battle to defend the soil against the threat of desertification, and the work you're going to do will matter to us all. Before we get into the details, I want to give you some background about what's going on in the world of climate. You know, when I founded American Resiliency in 2021 and started making these climate outlooks, I called them 2050 climate forecasts. Back then, it seemed reasonable to think we'd hit 2C at mid-century. That was the consensus science, but that was then. 2023, as you know, was a very serious year in climate. You can see we hit 2C for a couple of days towards the end of the year, and we were also around 2C a couple of days so far in February. Let's switch over to the figure with the updated monthly averages now. You can see this is another figure from the Copernicus Institute. This is a high value source. And you can see here that, thank goodness, we do have a downward trend for the global temperature for March and April of 24, but we are not out of the woods yet. You can see we are clearly still well over 1.5C. You can see from the data here, anyone who tells you 1.5C is somewhere out there in the future, they're just not up to date. So all that forces us to change our thinking. This outlook, it's a 2C outlook. And as far as the timeline goes, it appears we're all going to find that out. So let's check the challenge level for Oregon at 2C. We're at 1.5 now. 2C is the next step. Just so you know where to find my source material, this outlook is based on the National Climate Assessment that was updated. The fifth National Climate Assessment dropped in November of 23. If you want to find the figures with me, they're here in chapters. You can go down to all figures. I also use information from the NCA Climate Atlas, and it's great if you want to look around in the atlas yourself. If you want to explore that same great county-level data found in the NCA 5 Atlas, thanks to Dustin, and AR volunteer, we have this wonderful tool set here. This is an original resource that is smooth, responsive, and lets us look at how that NCA 5 data interacts in different ways. Of particular note, we have a new approximation for wet bulb risk at 1.5 and 2C. That's important information as you're choosing where to dig in and how to build resilience in place. Just to state again, in the tool set there, we've got the same great data. It's more user-friendly, though, and I want you to be doing your own research. I want you to be able to confirm everything I report without too much work on your end. So that tool set should help you do that. And we're using the fifth National Climate Assessment data and figures because they represent the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this document, and you deserve access to the NCA5 information. But as a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the National Climate Assessment. That made me so mad that I founded American Resiliency. We're the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public, and we run on your donations. Looking at a national overview for changes at 2C here, you can see in figure 1.14, Oregon is the only state spanning all three change bands in the continental U.S. So that's a sign right off the bat. We're looking at a wide range in the local outlook across the state with total warm-ups ranging from 3 to 6 degrees F. Let's take a look at what that's going to mean in terms of seasonal impacts in figure 2.11. Well, this is a fascinatingly complex situation just at a glance. One bit of good news that pops right away. We're not looking at many more warm nights, many more nights over 70 anywhere in the state. And let's zoom in on that. Let's check out what's going on here. All right. So there's a couple of little warmer pockets. We see two small pockets there that might see one extra week above 70 in those nice valley areas bordering Washington and Idaho by Hermiston and Ontario, respectively. And that level of nighttime warming on its own for the vast majority of crops, this is a good signal. This is not going to be severe enough to cause serious problems. But let's look over at the daytime warning. That's a heck of a lot of variation there. Coos County, Oregon, you got no additional days projected over 95. Great for you. Mahler County, you got close to 30 additional days. 
Let's look at what's good here is that there's no big heat increase at all indicated for those lovely coastal communities where we saw the good preservation of nighttime cool as well. So they've got two strong signals. Now I've pulled up Dustin's total heat map here because I'm suspicious of hidden heat, heat over 100. And yes, Portland and Salem, I'm seeing that you are looking at close to a week of additional hot days. And I can tell you that that is going to peak at 100, according to the NCA5 data set, on the regular at 2C. Regular summer highs around 100. And unfortunately, down by Medford, where we're looking at a lot of additional heat, almost additional month over 95, I'm sorry to say we're looking at regular summer peaks over 105. So along that whole Willamette Valley, we're talking about a fierce extension to the hot season. Bend, Oregon, you're looking at an additional week over 95 and closer to 20 days of an intense heat extension, peaking over 105 down by Medford. We also see 20 to 25 days of total heat extension in those warm border towns with Washington and Oregon. Some parts of the U.S. I wouldn't sneeze over a week's hot season extension, but I don't like seeing that in the Willamette Valley, that kind of heat becoming regular because the typical summer high there was more in the 80s than the 90s. You're going to be talking about communities where many people don't have air conditioning. I know you all had that horrible heat dome in 2021 with highs reaching 116. I know there's more fear and concern around heat in Oregon than there used to be, and those are entirely reasonable concerns. Preparing for extreme heat unfortunately looks like a pretty regular thing as we look towards a 2C future for Oregon. A summer that regularly peaks over 100 in a population center is a summer where you need to take cooling seriously every year. Again, I don't want us to freak out. This hot season extension could be worse, but it speaks to a changing character in the local climate. It's going to be tough on established plants and ecosystems to regularly face this new level of heat. I am concerned about the potential for this heat to kill pines and drive grasslands expansion. Let's look at the changes to the winter and bring about a fuller picture of how the landscape will change. In 2.11, again, we're seeing intense variation in change to the duration of your cold season. We see limited cold loss in the Willamette Valley, just a week or so of cold loss there. But in the mountains and all through eastern Oregon, that cold loss looks substantial. We're looking at three to four weeks of cold loss with the most cold loss concentrated at the mountain peaks. So that's duration, and that looks concerning from a snowpack perspective already. But let's look at cold intensity before we begin speculating about that. Let's look at figure 11.3. So I'm showing you the full figure of 11.3 here. It's unusably large. We're going to be looking at a snip in just a minute from our present-day climate normals and our mid-century projection, which is about equivalent to 2C. I just want to show you that further out information is readily available. Let's go to the snips. All right, so we're looking at pretty stable winter lows by the coast, but that's a big cold loss in eastern Oregon. We're talking about a 10, even a 15 degree lift in your winter lows. That's going to impact snowpack and landscapes. It's time to look at that water picture. In figure 210, we don't see statistical significance in this mild rain increase over the Willamette Valley. See, no cross hatching, no statistical significance. Although it does look like more rain is coming to eastern Oregon. Let's get another view. We're going to go over to figure 4.3. Well, this is a concerning signal here in 4.3. It's a conserved signal across models indicating a drought trend in the Willamette Valley. Mild drought trend, half an inch less of rain. But still, I don't like it. With the increase in heat there, that's two signs of stress on the landscape. Looking at 4.5, where we're looking at the changes in the snow water equivalent, I really hate it. There's a big projected loss in your snow water equivalent on this figure, Oregon. We're talking five or more inches of water loss in terms of snowpack equivalent, and we're not seeing any signal that you're getting enough of an increase in precipitation to make up for it. This is a concerning water outlook for Oregon. Looking again between 4.3 and 4.5, where we're talking about the lack of the snowpack, there's a real difference in the outlook between Oregon and Washington, right? In Washington there, we see similarly serious changes in the mountains in terms of their ability to hold snowpack, but there's precipitation coming up to level out the loss of that snow water equivalent. In Washington, there's going to be a lot of change, but there's more possibility of water balance in Oregon. I'm very concerned that I'm seeing a fairly intense signal for desertification across multiple factors, and I'm very sorry to bring you this serious news. Now, these figures we've looked at, I don't think they account for all the rain you could get through atmospheric rivers, which are forecast to be more intense and irregular as we move towards 2C. So you could occasionally get a big deluge heading your way, which means there's some important potential for water capture and storage. 
But the overall picture we're seeing here is one of a drying landscape. And I feel like we need to talk a little bit about what that means. We're talking about stress on the land that will change the landscape. Desert and grassland will be coming in as trees die. And this level of stress, we should expect tree death. We should expect what they call grasslands conversion. You might have enough water to keep an oak savanna, and you might not. In this high change area, the fight is for the soil. As we lose trees, as the landscape changes, encouraging the spread of the grassland, helping to bring in plants will keep that soil covered in a healthy way. We wanna try and spread natives, lower elevation grasslands. You could bring that seed up higher. This is a topic where you're gonna to wanna to talk with local conservation districts. This link is gonna be in the video description if you wanna try and get in touch with your local conservation districts. They're gonna be your best source of knowledge because I'm sorry to say, federal resources on species migration tap out west of Iowa, but I know that our people in Oregon won't tap out. We may see expansion of high desert as well as grassland. And if you're interested in the high desert specifically and what kind of landscapes we're talking about that might see increase, I'd like you to direct you to the High Desert Partnership, this foundation right here, because I wanna show you that there are people in Oregon doing the work and teaching others. When you all work in the ground out there, you don't know how important you could be to us all, because what happens when there's landscape change without care for the soil, the soil can be blown up into the air. High levels of atmospheric soil, of dust in the air, is believed to have been a causative factor of the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, and we saw record highs then in the Midwest during the Dust Bowl that haven't been broken since, over 108 across the Northern Midwest. That was from soil loss primarily in Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Nebraska. And I tell you, I was concerned about the level of soil loss we were experiencing in Iowa early this spring. At night, the stars looked red through the soil in the air, and that is a sign my great-grandmother taught me to fear who lived through the Dust Bowl. But we're doing better now in Iowa. We're having the frequent gentle rains we need for the land to bind together this year. And we have had a big increase in our use of cover crops, which also helps. But, you know, if we lost the soil of Oregon, if we saw a big dust bowl come out of Oregon, I don't know how big that heat dome could be. How much of the country the dust could cover with the heat dome. Those of you working the ground in Oregon, those of you who are protecting the soil, we may never know the size of the tragedy you could spare us. But I think, we ought to be keeping it in mind as we think about the importance of your work. Of course, there's gonna be an increased risk for wildfire under these conditions. Looking at the fire impacts in 7.4, we're looking at a three to four times multiplier on fire danger across most of the state, including in the mountains and near the Willamette Valley. Where you see white on this map, it means the risk isn't modeled. I would be concerned about hidden risk in the white on this map for Oregon. In terms of on the ground action, in a high change scenario like this, you're gonna to wanna to watch for tree death on your property and in your neighborhood. And to protect your community from fire danger, you're gonna to wanna to consider getting dead wood out. We're gonna to need to follow the California model here. They have been learning hard lessons about fire and they want us to learn from those lessons. They want us clearing safe landscape margins developing our ability to seal our homes against embers because most homes that burn, burn from within and having a plan for if we need to evacuate in case of fire. Let me tell you, Oregon, this whole situation really makes me mad. According to the NCA5, Oregon has warmed the most of the states in the Pacific Northwest and Oregon looks to be continuing to experience the highest overall level of warming in the region. It's not clear why beyond simple geography. It's not like you deserve it. And people there have been working so hard to take care of the land. The biggest climate stability we're seeing in Oregon is in those coastal communities. Let's see how they're gonna do with sea level rise. So this is the NOAA sea level rise viewer. It's an extremely powerful tool. You can get address level information there. There are so many little communities in Oregon that I don't wanna drag you all the way up and down this coast, give you sort of a Blair Witch Project effect. I want you to see that I'm gonna be modeling three feet of sea level rise and 10 feet of sea level rise because we are getting troubling signals in from Antarctica that we're probably gonna be looking at a high end rise scenario. You can go in and look at the details for yourself. If you live here, I'm gonna just read a list of outcomes that I saw as I crawled up and down the coast looking at Oregon's communities. Even at 10 feet of sea level rise, I'm happy to say we see many communities with great resilience potential on the coast of Oregon. Port Oxford, you're looking pretty good. Bandon, you look pretty good. North Bend, very serious damage with big changes to the dune. Lake sites, you're losing your margins of safety, but you have mild direct damage. Florence, mild damage, like 
surprisingly okay considering your overall topography. Waldport, I'm sorry, you're totally swamped in a high-end rise scenario. You got a lot of beach loss on Holly Beach. Seal Rock is losing the beach, but a lot of the development is high enough up. There's not a lot of direct property damage. Ona Beach, I'm sorry to say, it looks just terrible. There's dramatic landscape transformation and a total loss of the beach. Newport and South Beach, you've got mixed outcomes. It looks real bad by South Beach, but as you move north, the outlook is pretty solid, actually, without a lot of property damage. We're looking at terrible damage to Pacific City. The landscape change around Tillamook is heartbreaking. It's very difficult. A lot of farmland lost. I'm very concerned about water table impacts well inland around Tillamook. Manzanita, you're a bright spot. Nearby, Nethalem and Wheeler are taking some serious damage, but Manzanita's damage is limited. For every one of these coastal communities, I'm sorry to say we don't have great modeling for your fire risk, but I don't think it's zero. I would build fire resilience even in these communities, even in these lower change communities where all the factors are lining up in terms of your uh, temperature and precipitation, and you look to be getting less scathed by the sea than others, even in those communities, those real gems, you've got an edge to hold, but you're going to need to be tough. Folks, this is a really upsetting outlook. If you're digging in in Oregon, you're going to need to expect high change and build resilience against fire. The drought trend and the heat increases, you know that those together are going to mean fire. The conditions projected here are serious enough. I think some folks might consider relocating. Outlook for Washington is not without challenges, but the overall water picture is much better. The overall climate stability is much better up over the border in Washington. In so many places in the U.S., it's going to come down to the water. And for Oregon, the water picture just isn't good. Water resilience, getting very serious about the responsible use of water, is going to be super important for the cities of the Willamette Valley. This water outlook is serious enough. The level of change is high enough. You absolutely need to defend against desertification. That soil needs to be kept covered to stay healthy. That soil needs to be nurtured through this time of change. The desert is going to want to spread. In Oregon, you're on the front line. Your work can mean grasslands instead of desert. Your work can help save the soil. By helping plant communities to adapt, by getting as much drought-resistant stuff into the landscape as possible, you can help promote the healthiest possible local water cycle. It's so much harder to rebuild soil than it is to prevent its loss. If you're going to hold your edge here, you need to be ready to fight. You need to be getting ready now. If you're going to be building resilience in place and you don't know where to start, I want to recommend my reasonable prep video to you so you have some structure for how to build resilience. First for three bad days or for an evacuation, then for three difficult weeks, then for a three-month hard season. Those are the time frames for resilience in a community setting where your mindset is digging in and supporting each other. That's a different preparation mindset than hoarding freeze-dried food in a bunker. Resilience supports communities, not just ourselves. Oregon, I don't like telling you bad news, but I'd like it worse to tell you lies. I know many of you, you're attached to your heart and soul. The work you do, the work you do to protect the soil, to nurture these landscapes through this high change time, it will define the potential that remains for future generations. What you can save, it's a lot harder to restore than it is to save. There's no battle I've seen yet as I move through these state-level outlooks as dire and serious as the emerging battle for the soil of the Willamette Valley. If you're fighting on the front lines, we want to hear from you and we want to support you. The changes that are coming are big, Oregon. You got to go into them with open eyes and the best information that you can. The resilience you build matters to us all. Let's get ready. Thanks for sticking with it through this hard one here. You know, I'm so grateful to all the support that I receive from the AR community in terms of the folks who give financially, in terms of the folks who make incredible volunteer contributions, in terms of the folks who are spreading the word online, and of course, the folks who are doing the hard work on the ground. That's where the battle is really going to be fought, folks. It's going to be the work on the ground. And if you're here with me through this Oregon outlook, you know now how hard that work is going to be. I want to be there with you for as long as I can, and I'm wishing you all the best. Let's get ready together, and I'll talk to you again soon.